right then so let's get into this we are a week behind so hopefully you had a chance to see the previous videos in the series and what I really want to dig into as we move forward is the transition what I mean by that is how did we go from being the chosen to the replaced how did we go from being in the land to being hunted and chased into other lands and eventually shackled and trafficked around the world. Well, we certainly know the cause of that, right? Our rebellion and sin. But certain things happened to create the narrative that we were a people cursed by our God and it was okay spiritually and legally to abuse and misuse us. So we want to know the whole story. There were attitudes that led to the sub-Saharan and transatlantic slave trade and even the lie about the lost tribes. Going back to the question, when did the Christians replace Israel? We will see the transition of how we went from being the head to the tail and Gentiles becoming kings and priests in the earth. So I hope to wrap all of this up in the next session by talking about the European monarchs, especially the English monarchs, because many believe that they represent the royal house of David in the earth today. Just think about that for a minute. Can we find documentation or scripture showing this legal transfer of rulership from the descendants of Shem to the children of Japheth? I think you know the answer, but as we make the connection, we will see how they stole the kingship and the priesthood and that the things we're uncovering about replacement theology in the new covenant is directly tied to all of that. So in the session, I want to fill in some more gaps about what led to the coup. And if you remember in Luke 21, Messiah gave a prophecy about the things that would happen to us because of our rejection of him. We can't overlook that fact. Even though many of our people believed in him as a whole or as a nation, I should say, Many of our ancestors failed to recognize the day of their visitation and agreed with the religious leaders of the day to hand him over to the Romans. So let's take a look at that prophecy. All right, so I am reading from Luke 21. We'll begin with verse 10. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be in, from heaven. But listen to what he says. He says, but before all these, so before all of these things happen, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And we know this happened. Many of them became martyrs. He says, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So he gives them instructions. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, like get out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance. What is that vengeance for? For what I just talked about, our people did not recognize the day of their visitation. He says that all things which are written 
may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that gave suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Who was there? Who was he talking to? The Yehudis. He says, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So that should answer the question about who's in the land today. Gentiles. Let's keep going. Let's continue looking, looking at the accounts written by those called the early church fathers. And again, they were Gentile converts writing the history of Christianity, the religion that had been created by the Roman Catholic Church. This excerpt comes from Cambridge.org and it's entitled Tertullian in answer to the Jews. So it says, it is said that when the future emperor Caracalla was about seven years old in AD 195 or 196, a fellow playmate, presumably slightly older, became inclined to Judaism and was so severely chastised by the Emperor Severus and his own father that the young prince took this punishment deeply to heart. Be that as it may, and we can hardly take Noel Deccan's suggestion seriously that this event in Rome moved Tertullian in Carthage to write our treatise. There is no doubt that a few Christians did apostatize to Judaism while, on the other hand, many were desirous of winning Jews to Christianity. Also, a large number of Jews lived in North Africa. Did you catch that? This is telling us that a lot of our people were living in Africa. So it says, as the big Jewish cemetery at Carthage still testifies, there was therefore sufficient reason for the adversus Judeos to be composed, both as a protection to Christians, who were they trying to protect while all this persecution was going on? It served as a protection to Christians and as a means of winning Jews. So we need to understand what Tertullian believed. Now, this article entitled The Church Fathers and the Jews tells us that Tertullian was a Christian author who produced a large body of literature in Latin. He was also an apologist who taught against heresy. But we need to understand what he means by heresy. It says Tertullian has been called the father of Latin Christianity and the founder of Western theology. He was one of the first church fathers to formulate Trinitarian terminology in his work, De Adversus Judeos, which means against the Jews. Tertullian's theological anti-Judaism is purely ideological. He might have gotten some of his inspiration from earlier works by Justin Martyr. And Justin Martyr didn't have a lot of good things to say about the Yehudis either. These church fathers were promoting Catholicism. So when they talk about the suffering of the early believers, we have to read between the lines to determine if they're talking about Israelites or Gentile converts. Now, no doubt, there were some converts who got caught up in this, but the overwhelming majority of those coming under persecution were Israelites. So it says, he uses the Hebrew scriptures to methodically disprove 
the relevancy of the Mosaic law and then goes on to prove that all blessings to ethnic Israel are now passed on to the other nation of God, the Christians. Let's find out a bit more about Justin Martyr. This comes from Christian History. And again, here's the link to refer to. The article begins talking about Justin Martyr's teacher. And it says, this teacher was a Stoic who knew nothing of God and did not even think knowledge of him to be necessary. So I'll drop down. It says, at last, about AD 130, after a conversation with an old man, his life was transformed. Talking about Justin Martyr. It says, a fire was suddenly kindled in my soul. I fell in love with the prophets and these men who had loved Christ. I reflected on all their words and found that this philosophy alone was true and profitable. This is how and why I became a philosopher. And I wish that everyone felt the same way that I do. It says, Justin continued to wear his philosopher's cloak, seeking to reconcile faith and reason. And that's what religion will do for you. It says, his teaching ministry took him first to Ephesus, where he held a disputation with Trypho, a Jew. So now he's arguing <laughs> with a Jew about scripture. Listen to this. It says where he held a disputation with Trypho, a Jew, about the true interpretation of scripture. And it's called the dialogue with Trypho. It says it teaches three main points. What are the points? That the old covenant is passing away to make place for the new. The logos is the God of the Old Testament and the Gentiles are the new Israel. Later, Justin moved to Rome, founded a Christian school and wrote two bold apologies or defenses from the Greek apologia. Justin's first apology addressed to Emperor Pius was published in 155 and attempted to explain the faith. What's the faith? Christianity was not a threat to the state, he asserted, and should be treated as a legal religion. What else does he say? It says, Justin argued that Christians are, in fact, the emperor's best helpers and allies in securing good order. Hmm. It goes on to say, listen to this, <laughs> don't miss this part. It says, Justin records detailed descriptions of early Christian worship to show unbelievers that Christianity was not subversive. So now, they're making it appealing to Romans. So it says the most famous passage is this. On the day called Sunday, there is a gathering together in the same place of all who live in a given city or rural district. The memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. What were they reading? The memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets. Then it goes on to say, when we cease from prayer, bread is presented in wine and water. The president in the same manner sends up prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability and the people sing out of their assent saying the amen. It says a distribution and participation of the elements for which thanks have been given is made to each person and to those who are not present, they are sent by the deacons. So by this time, remember what had happened. 
The Israelites had been forced out of the city and their leaders had been martyred. So the pagans were now the leaders in these groups. They began rewriting things, saying that the Lord's Day had preeminence over the Sabbath and Easter should be the focus and not Passover. This is the history that was passed down through their writings and made its way into the New Testament. So whose history have we really been following? Now let's see what some of the other so-called church fathers had to say. Some of you may have heard of Origen, Origen of Alexandria. He was considered a church father who contributed to the early formation of Christian doctrines. So a quote from him says, we may thus assert in utter confidence that the Jews will not return to their earlier situation, for they have committed the most abominable of crimes. In forming this conspiracy against the savior of the human race, hence the city where, speaking of where Messiah suffered, it was necessary, he says, for this city to be destroyed. So he says the Jewish nation was driven from its country and another people was called by God to the blessed election. Another one you should know about is Chrysotham. And he's still considered to be one of the greatest of all of these so-called church fathers and is known as the golden mouthed orator. And a lot of what he had to say about our people make what the others had to say pale <laughs> in comparison. So listen to what he says. He says the synagogue is worse than a brothel. It is the den of scoundrels and the repair of wild beasts, the temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults, the refuge of brigands and debauchees and the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ, a house worse than a drinking shop, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf and an abyss of perdition. I would say the same things about their souls. Wow. As for me, listen to what he says. I hate the synagogue. I hate the Jews for the same reason. Men who are lustful, rapacious, greedy, perfidious, bandits, inveterate, what else does he say? Murderers, destroyers, men possessed by the devil. They have surpassed the ferocity of wild beasts for they murder their offspring. Wow. And emulate them to the devil. Now, when you think of those who say they are Jews and they are not, we would say a lot of these things fit them perfectly. However, do you see how these statements lump all? of the Israelites together. The disciples wouldn't fit in this category. And a lot of our people, the elect would not fit in this category because many of them did believe in Messiah. But these early church fathers were creating a narrative and it is the narrative that would generate the kind of hatred that led to the enslavement of our people. And he wasn't finished, you all. He said, what is this disease? The festivals of the pitiful and the miserable Jews are soon to march upon us one after the other and in quick succession. The Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Fast. I wish to drive this perverse custom from the church right now that the Jewish festivals are close by and at the very door if I should fail to cure those who are sick with the Judaizing disease. He says, I'm afraid that because of their ill-suited association and deep ignorance, some Christians may partake in the Jews' transgressions. Once they have done so, I fear, 
my homilies on these transgressions will be in vain. For if they hear no word from me today, they will then join the Jews in their fast. Once they have committed this sin, it will be useless for me to apply the remedy. So beginning with these church fathers and then with Constantine coming on the scene, laws began to be passed against our people. And they were only the starting point of centuries of laws being aimed at controlling and ostracizing, demonizing, and eventually trafficking our people. So here are some of the things that they were enacting, particularly in AD 325, uh, when during the time of the Council of Nicaea. So here are some of the things they were saying. There was a death penalty for the circumcision of slaves. Jews were forbidden to own Christian slaves. Listen to what I just said. Jews were forbidden to own Christian slaves. There was a death penalty for embracing the Jewish faith. There was a death penalty for Jews who were versed in the law and those who aided them. There was a death penalty for marriages between Jews and Christians and a death penalty for attending Jewish religious assemblies. So I want to share this article with you from Catholic Education Resource Center and it says, the church and the Jews in the Middle Ages. It says, we might well wish that the relationship between the medieval Catholic church and the Jews had been better, friendlier, more modern, but it was not modern, nor should we expect it to be. It was, however, a relationship marked by mutual respect, mutual respect and a remarkable degree of tolerance, really, in an age that knew little of either. Now, keep in mind that the other thing that was happening during this time is that our people were being whited out. We were no longer in our land and another people would convert to Judaism. Let's keep going. It says, early church fathers like Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, Eusebius, and others wrote tracts against Judaism. Yet none of them called for persecution. They didn't have to. <laughs> they didn't have to. It says, instead, they admonished fellow Christians who persisted in Jewish practices like St. Paul's Galatians and made the case that Christianity was not a new religion, but a culmination of Judaism. The latter assertion was important since potential Roman converts measured a religion, measured a religion's worth in terms of its antiquity. So you see how they merged it. So it says the Roman persecutions of Christians came to an abrupt end. When? With the conversion of the Emperor Constantine. Listen to this. In a flash, Christianity went from a struggling underground religion to the faith of the aristocracy. Constantine, who saw himself not only as Roman emperor, but the defender of the church, issued several laws regarding the Jews. He forbade the Jewish practice of stoning converts to Christianity and ordered Jews to stop circumcising their Christian slaves. He also made it unlawful for Christians to convert to Judaism. 
You get the picture? <laughs> it says his son, Constance, outlawed intermarriage between Jews and Christians. In every other way, though, the emperors left the Jews alone. They retained full rights as citizens, including the right to worship freely. Now, if we believe that, then we have to ask, why was there a need for the Inquisition? Now, listen to this article. This is from academia.edu, entitled, The Constantinople, New Jerusalem at the Crossing of Sacred Space. So it says, by the end of the 5th century, particularly after the half-failed attempt of the Council of Chalcedon to bring Constantinople to the same ecclesiastical function as Rome, the rise of the theme of the New Jerusalem. They wanted to promote this idea of a New Jerusalem reflected the substantial Christianization of the Roman power. A Christian history set in to back up Roman history and eventually to merge so thoroughly together so as to amount to a substitution. So you all, the role of the early church fathers were coming to fruition. The Christian history was set, it says, to back up Roman history. Did you catch that? Christianity became the substitution for Roman history and vice versa. Remember, those who control the narrative control the world. Let's keep going. So listen to this. This is the Catholic Church's timeline of critical points in history. A lot of these things will sound familiar to you. By 362 AD, they had a council in Asia Minor and they were excommunicating anyone encouraging a slave to despise his master or withdraw from his service. This became part of church law beginning in the 13th century. By 354 AD, St. Augustine was teaching that the institution of slavery came from the Most High and was beneficial to slaves and masters. By 650 AD, there was a Pope Martin who condemned people who were teaching slaves about freedom or encouraging them to escape. By 1179 AD, they had the Third Lateran Council and they imposed slavery on those helping the Saracens. By 1226 AD, the legitimacy of slavery had been incorporated by Pope Gregory and remained the official law of the church until 1913. Did you hear what I just said? It remained the official law of the Roman Catholic Church until 1913. So it says, the canon lawyers worked out four just titles for holding slaves. Slaves captured in war, persons condemned to slavery for a crime, persons selling themselves into sl slavery, including a father selling his child, children of a mother who is a slave. Sounds familiar? Let's keep going. Now by 1224 AD, you have Thomas Aquinas, and I hate calling these people saints. He was defending slavery saying it was instituted by the Most High in punishment for sin. Now, what's interesting is that these sins didn't seem to apply to the European nations. And it says, and justified as being part of the right of nations and natural law. So these European nations had the right to enslave others. 
Who gave them that right? Their priests, the Roman Catholic Church. So you see the blending of church and state. The church sanctioned things spiritually, and then the state enacted laws to make it legal. So it says, Children of a slave mother are rightly slaves even though they have not committed personal sin. Do you see how they got that law here? So it says, Pope Nicholas V issued the papal bull, Dum Diversus, and it authorized King Alfonso V of Portugal to reduce any Saracen, pagan, and other unbelievers to perpetual sl slavery. Now we know which group of people that impacted the most. It says the same Pope wrote the bull Romanus Pontifex to Alfonso as a follow-up to Dum Diversus and it extended to the Catholic nations of Europe. All of the Catholic nations were given dominion over discovered lands during the age of discovery. So this is where they actually sanction theft, murder, rape. So it says, along with sanctifying, listen to this, sanctifying the seizure of non-Christian lands. They could go and take lands from people if they were not one of these European, supposedly Christian nations. So it says, it encouraged the enslavement of, listen, native non-Christian peoples in Africa and the New World who lived in those places. By 1493 AD, Pope Alexander VI had authorized the King of Spain to enslave non-Christians of the Americas who were at war with Christian powers. So when the people who were here stood up and fought back, oh, they were automatically sanctioned to enslave them. Do you see the wickedness of this? By 1494 AD, Pope Alexander VI then entered into this treaty called the Tor de Silas, and it divided the known world between the two countries. And it says, here's why they did it. There was a need to locate a group to work in areas where the supply of indigenous labor was insufficient to sustain their colonies. Spain and Portugal imported Africans. I know you can hear it in my voice. I'm really doing what I can to hold myself together as I go through this. But by the 1500s, 1500 to 1850 AD, 12 million Africans arrived in the Americas to toil as slaves. The vast majority of these slaves worked in the Catholic colonies of Spain and Portugal. By 1548 AD, Pope Paul confirms the right of clergy and laity to own slaves. By 1866 AD, Pope Pius declares slavery itself considered as such in its essential nature is not at all contrary to the natural and divine law. And there can be several just titles of slavery. And these are referred to by approved theologians and commentators of the sacred canons. It is not contrary to the natural and divine law for a slave to be sold, bought, exchanged, or given. What's interesting is that the apostles and the early believers of the way were not going around enslaving people in the name of Messiah. They were not enslaving the people thought to be sinners. They were not enslaving those who did not receive Messiah. 
but this is exactly what the Catholics and Protestants were doing in the name of religion. Need I say more? So let's look at this article called The Role of the Roman Catholic Church in Slavery. The link is here if you'd like to continue reading. It says some historians argue that if churches had used their power, the Atlantic slave trade might have never occurred by the same logic. Others argue that the Catholic Church and Catholic missionaries could have also helped to prevent the colonization and brutality of colonialism in Africa. However, history shows that the Catholic Church did not oppose the institution of slavery until the practice had already become infamous in most parts of the world. In most cases, the churches and church leaders did not condemn, condemn slavery until the 17th century. The five major countries that dominated slavery and the slave trade in the New World were either Catholic or still retained strong Catholic influences, including Spain, Portugal, France, and England, and the Netherlands. I will end with the scripture from Deuteronomy 37 through 10. These are the words that Moses spoke to the people. And I want to read it to remind us that the atrocities of all of these nations will not go unpunished. They will reap what they have sown. But we have to continue turning to the Most High and crying out to him in repentance. But we know that vengeance belongs to him and his word will not return unto him void. So it says, also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you, and you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So next time we're going to look at the illegal transfer of power of those who claim to be the kings and priests in the earth. Be sure to hit like, share, and join me next time. Shalom everyone.